This episode of Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. If you want to become a patron, go to wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? Tonight we're doing a fringe news show, and I have with me Mr. Ren Collier. Hey, everyone. Adam Sane. Hello. And for the first time, his uh, sometimes co-host, Surfail. He Hello. is the co-host. And what? <laughs> he it's is official. the co-host. He's the official co-host. co-host. Okay, good. I thought so, but I didn't want to say that. <laughs> I didn't want to jinx anything. <laughs> I know what Adam does to his co-hosts, and it's, it's wow. <laughs> Yeah, so, it's pretty hard. You don't want to. I put him through. The, I put him through the uh, through his courses on the show. You know. <laughs> you don't want to know what we did to the last one. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what happened to Luke. You don't want to find out. I figured Luke just fell asleep and stayed that way. <laughs> we yeah, think he's the, still somewhere the in the. We think he's still somewhere in the couch. We think he's like <laughs> maybe he's in like uh, Rob's refrigerator or something. I mean, he might uh, not be where he is. Went in there for a beer, never came back out. <laughs> All right, so we have a bunch of news stories to go over. I do want to say one thing first. As much as I am uh, not for censorship of any kind, if people leave bigoted or sexist-type comments on our YouTube videos, they get deleted. They are pretty much the only ones that get deleted. I, you know, I don't care how crazy someone's ideas are. They're welcome to express them, but when... Uh, we put up the the show talking about the copyright stuff. I don't know if it was the news show or the show I did with Walter, uh, but someone started putting up comments about how the Jews need to be taken care of and they're behind all this. Oh, and, no. And I'm like, well, you're gone. Okay. So uh, yeah. that that and behind people behind what? What were the Jews behind? I don't remember the whole comment. It was it was about the whole uh-huh. copyright thing and taking all our money and everything else. It uh-huh. actually. It actually made me laugh at first because he started going off on Gene Simmons. <laughs> oh, man. And I was like, ah, okay. Oh, wait. Now it's into an anti-Semitic rant. Okay. Well, you know, Gene Simmons is greedy. I'm not going to argue that, but I, I would argue that it's not because he's Jewish. <laughs> you, you know, Soraya, I had a guest one time, and uh, I, know, I know you don't like to talk about the conspiracy stuff, but... I had a guest one time, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but people can find it in the archives if they really want to, who, to prove that he was not anti-Semitic, started going into Holocaust denial. Uh, yeah. I, I don't, that doesn't compute? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was rather confusing for me as well. <laughs> huh. Um... Yeah, that that and the only other ones I you know will delete are when people will just personally insult guests of the show or mm-hmm. other co-hosts or something. You know, occasionally there are the anti uh, the the anti women posts when we have women on the uh, on on the show, which oh, is just ridiculous. And uh, the majority yeah. of our, the majority of our YouTube comments are intelligent, interesting comments. There's certainly the the crazy ones. And uh, some you, those to me are sometimes entertaining. Uh, I don't get to go through everything though. Uh, the comments on the show on YouTube are just there's a ridiculous number, but uh, some of the ones that have popped up recently just kind of like got under my skin a little because they were you know anti-Semitic comments or racist comments or you know just stuff like that, and it's just like okay, that's getting deleted. <laughs> Everyone who ruins the internet, pretty much. Right, right. So. Other than that, people have a pretty free say. I mean, I don't take off comments that are critical of the stuff being discussed. Everyone's, you know, welcome to express their viewpoint as far as I'm concerned, as long as they're not attacking people like that. Especially based on things that are not something people should be attacked over, like gender or race or whatever. Yeah. Well, you, yeah. You, you've got some pretty lonely and pretty upset and pretty scary people out there. 
True. As is evidenced by everything that's going on right now. So that is very true. A lot so, of cockroaches coming through the woodwork. <laughs> and uh and, and an update for people who have asked on, on my uh my home situation as regards the flooding that happened all the way back in August. Uh I still don't have heat. Um and the weather decided in October here in upstate New York to go from eighty five to thirty in like two days. And it's pretty much been sitting in the thirty to fifty degree mark and you know, for the last uh month or so and I'm working on getting a furnace, but currently we have a few space heaters in a very big house. Adam's seen it. He knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. And uh, so most of the house with the space heaters is about 50 degrees. Um, the rooms that don't have space heaters are 40, 40 to 45 degrees, and I'm mildly concerned about my pipes freezing. Um, I have a weatherization from uh, the state looking into getting us or fixing our furnace, but you know we're coming into Thanksgiving, so who knows how soon that's going to happen. Ooh. It's, do it's, you have do you have snow up there yet? Has it? Oh, we got a foot of snow like today. That? Yeah, we got a foot of snow today, which is unusual. Um, the last few years, especially, it's been warm until literally until winter, and uh, you know, it's they said initially a foot of snow, and I went, oh sure, they're coming to look at my furnace, and we're going to get a foot of snow, and then it changed to three to five inches, and I went, oh that's much better, okay, and then I got up, and there was a foot of snow, and I was like, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> but they did still show up and marveled about how high the water got in the basement. I'm like, yeah, great. <laughs> Man. So fun times all around. Do you have any mold damage from that? Sorry, oh, yeah. You- yeah, there's, yeah, there's mold damage. Now, that That's the least of my concerns at the moment. Yeah. that That's not serious damage. Uh, that's, you know, some of that I've already taken care of. Uh, Some of it I'll get to, but it's not spreading. It's, you know, I mean, water does a lot. But then, you know, I look at California and I go, yep, I'll take the water. I Mm -hmm. will (laughs) totally take the water to the wildfires. Holy crap. So, wish we could give them some of our water. By the way, are you seeing, um, this this may be a little bit of uh, of a scientific thing, so we're going to talk a little bit about some science stuff later, but... um, have you seen these posts about people talking about how the the forest fires have been caused by laser beams? Yes. Have you seen this? Yeah. I didn't really look too much into it. Yeah. Well, I, talk- I, that's, not, that's not a new thing. I, I've actually heard people talking about that uh, with other forest, other forest fire events. Huh. But is there anything to it? Probably not. Yeah, because I saw some of the videos or the still images, and I'm like, this really isn't convincing enough. Yeah. How, how, how do people even get these images? The other thing that I've been hearing about with these forest fires is they've been talking about how uh, they put pictures of like how there's houses have burned, but some of the trees have not. Mm. I, I think it's just the way fire, I mean, houses are going to burn quite easy, easily. Yes doesn't take yeah. much it's it's hard i'm not an expert on this stuff so i'm not going to say what's you know what's going right. to happen or what's not going to happen but i know fire can do strange things um i know it doesn't take an energy weapon to start a forest fire this is something that's been going on for as long as i remember so it just takes a lot of drought and just really dry and it yep. doesn't take much yeah exactly and then it spreads very quickly Mm-hmm. All right, so let's get into some of this fringe news. And, uh, you know, the first one I want to address is, uh, actually, no, I want Ren to address this this <laughs> thing about the video games you were telling me. Oh, yeah. So, like, I was just, um, I had made a joke on Twitter. Uh, a person that I, I follow had made a joke about, like, philosophy or something. And I said something to the lines of, like, uh, the, the only philosopher i want to hear about is the philosopher's legacy that sweet pile of cash that will buy me a weapon to surpass metal gear and then i started thinking about it so like i'm referencing like the metal gear series of games uh it's a series of video games developed by uh, konami and directed by um, a game designer named uh, hideo kojima um they started coming out i think in the like 80s and uh, i think the most recent game in the series just came out like last year 
So they've been going for a long time. Um, they're really great games. They're a great example of like what can be done with the medium. Um, but one interesting thing I've always found about the series is that um, it always kind of includes like big ideas. Uh, there's a lot of like conspiracy theory type stuff put into it. And it tends to like predict what's actually going to come about in like conspiracy theory and pop culture by several years. Like uh, the kind of example most people are familiar with is a Metal Gear Solid 2, um, a game that came out like uh, pre 9-11, kind of predicted in a lot of ways our current sort of, I guess, social internet climate, mm -hmm. like the way social networking works now. Uh, the way it kind of forms people into like tribal groups that um, share information with each other without any regard for whether or not it's true and everything sort of lacks any real context. Um, that's like a huge plot element within the game that the sort of the antagonists of the game, like this secret group of people within, you know, sort of high levels of government and, and financial power sort of want to create this system to like censor and control the flow of information on the internet as a way to control society because they're, they're afraid that if the flow of information is not regulated, that it will basically just descend into chaos and like mankind will start to stagnate and eventually destroy itself. So mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting because it predicted kind of like, social networking and a lot of the problems that come along with it before there were really any social networks. This is pretty MySpace even. Um, but it wasn't really a prediction of that because it was kind of based on the, the writer of the game. I can't remember his name now, but it's, it's sort of like it was sort of playing on certain ideas that were popular in Japan at the time about how people interacted over mobile phones and like yeah. uh, how gossip would spread over text messaging and things like that. Um, mm. And there are a couple other uh, sort of games that, that tackle the same subject. Like I know the uh, the Persona series, like the early Persona games, kind of go into that. But um, <clears throat> the thing I was referencing in, in with the Philosopher's Legacy thing is in Metal Gear Solid 3, there's this idea that after the end of World War II, <clears throat> there's this enormous amount of like money, uh, you know, from like basically war spoils, Nazi gold, like all this other stuff. It's like, you know, it's like hundreds of billions of dollars worth of money, and it's uh, and they it's called like the philosopher's legacy, and it's kind of held by this secretive group of like you know super elites that are using it to develop like you know crazy future technology in the 1960s, and basically use that money to shape the geopolitical like outcomes of the next like 30, 40 years. And develop all, you know, develop all this crazy technology and sort of form like a breakaway civilization, basically. Yeah. Hmm. And I was like, this game came out like, I don't know, like 2003, I think, or something like that. This is like before I remember anybody really talking about like the breakaway civilization, black budget, like all this money going missing stuff. And I, I just thought it was funny. I was like, you know, it kind of kind of predicted all that like kind of stuff, too, as well. Interesting. Well, yeah, exactly. I, I, I guess too, if you're if you're smart enough to look at the 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 way history repeats itself and the way things, you know, mm -hmm. the nature of things, it's not that hard to predict some of this stuff if you're yeah in, in tune with it. Yeah, it just it just goes to show like how smart the games are, and you know I don't think it's totally out of the blue. I'm not saying that it actually like predicted any of that stuff. There's just an interesting parallel there that is like way earlier than I remember hearing about anything like that, but. You know, it's it's still tied up in like other sort of conspiracy type stuff that was going on in the United well, it, States. It would be, um, you know, some someone in a more more uh, technological country, you know, mm -hmm. especially what was going on in Japan. They were way ahead of us, so you know, maybe mm -hmm. it would have been easier for the for them to predict that. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Yeah, cause that that series has kind of always been on like the cutting edge of of, I guess, social issues which you know a lot of video games don't really do i mean it's not like video games have have um have come a long way but they're still not quite there yet in terms of being uh vehicles for social commentary and ideas that's cool yeah but if you yeah. like if you if you think that sounds cool i don't know maybe go play uh, go play metal gear solid you might like <laughs> it 
it reminds me, Ren, of um, the John Teeter stuff. Yeah, a little bit mm-hmm. because um, you could really make a case. That, well, I think you really can that John Teeter wasn't a time traveler; that it was just someone that, like, um, a, like a futurist that would look at yeah. trends. Well, and see how things would develop. Did you see uh, Kathor Jensen's big article about the John Teeter stuff? No. Oh. Okay, so. Yeah, sorry to burst everyone's bubble in the John Teter thing, but he came forward. Like, it's it's solved now. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah, it was. So um, we know who it is. They knew huh? who it is? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't remember his first name. It's something Matheny. Or something. Oh, oh yeah, Jason yeah, Matheny. Yeah, Jason yeah. Matheny, yeah. Yeah, he, he came forward with it. Now, he said that he didn't do all of it. Like, yeah. him and his friends start. It wasn't even just him, too. It was, like, him and his friends. Like, him and his friends yeah. started it as, like, you know, basically, like, an Ong's hat kind of yes, thing yeah, just yeah. like it's an ARG kind of thing and they thought it was funny and like they were kind of interested in like how far it would go because it's like early internet right this is like the first kind of experiment with like viral media and um, he said that later on he thinks other people took it over and were like yes. you know they kept it's doing because a- he, he got out before you know there were people were still doing the John Teeter character like after he quit doing it so if I'm so not he mis- admits it now yeah, yeah he admits it now yeah. If I'm not mistaken, he was on years ago on Project Archivist t- saying that very thing. Yeah, he was. yeah, yeah. And uh, Kathor Jensen wrote a really good article for Thrillist, I think, that went over sort of the whole story and, like, uh, you know, he interviewed people and stuff like that. It was really good. But, yeah, that's that's unfortunately kind of all solved now. It kind of takes all the fun out of it now that you know it's, it was all. I think we are going to see a lot more ARG stuff. I yeah. Mean, going crazy now and it's it's totally divorced from the fact that people used to do this and that you know these were things that were revealed to be hoaxes i think a yeah. lot of this like new generation and not necessarily young people but mm-hmm. uh newly politicized people on the internet and stuff are really going to be i mean we're already seeing some i think there's a lot of future it's gonna be crazy i mean you know <laughs> i personally this is uh the, the views of of ren collier um I personally think the whole QAnon thing is. Sort yeah, of I mean similar. that's exactly what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. But I know we're not supposed to talk about conspiracy <laughs> theories. <laughs> Sorry, sir. Yeah. That's all right. So sorry yeah. for a QAnon fan, but I think it's a John T. Tour thing too. But yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not even familiar with that. Well, it's 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 so it's so damn vague that yeah, you uh, you don't uh, people are just picking out of it what they want to hear, what they want to see. Yeah. You you know what the QAnon is. No, no, I have no idea. Yeah, it it so sounds Q- vaguely familiar. So help me out, Ren. Uh, uh, it's so, this um, like secret secret guy who posts. Where did it 4chan. start? Was it Reddit? Was it Reddit? I think it started on 4chan. 4chan. Okay. Yeah. There's supposedly an in- informer within the administration uh, who's you know feeding the secret intel um, of uh, of what you know the president is really trying to do to uh, yeah. I guess yeah. what to to oh, okay. feel a giant right. network and, of pedophiles and the New World Order people, you know, craziness. And yeah, they, so, get, they get so, Q from the Department of Energy has a the only the only well uh, the only department that has a Q clearance where they a, a top secret clearance of Q is the mm-hmm. Department of Energy. Yeah. That's nowhere been stated. It's just this person called Q started putting up all these crypt- <laughs> all these cryptic remarks. Yeah, it's all it's all like now, stuff like uh, there's a storm coming and you know. Yeah. Oh, okay, I guess I did hear of some of this. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah it now, blew up on mainstream it's media. It's yeah. starting to it's starting to kind of uh, they're starting to kind of turn against each other now because Uh-oh. they had this whole idea that. Thought. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they had this whole idea that. Uh, Trump and Mueller and Sessions were all working together to put Hillary Clinton and all the pedophile network behind bars. That was the whole, that was what the storm was. <laughs> and so now that um, the Democrats have gained the House and also Trump fired Sessions, that's t- totally throwing all that out of the water. So they're just kind of like in mass confusion at this moment. Yeah. My my favorite like great oh, twist on the QAnon oh. story has been the recent thing that like he's actually John F Kennedy, who, John like, Kennedy Jr. Is John F Kennedy Jr. Yeah, yeah. and he's like uh, still a lot. He like faked right. his death, and he's like right. fighting the pedophiles from behind the scenes. Wow, yeah, it's 
It's gotten really, and there's like, you know, and there were rumors that like, you know, it was started by actually by a group of like, like um, Italian anarchists or something. <laughs> like, like there's all kinds of like weird theories about where it came from. That um, it's basically to troll right wingers, essentially. Yeah. 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 Well, let's let's talk about something uh, not totally connected, but not totally different. Um, so, the Church of Satan is suing the makers of the Adventures of the uh, the Adventures of Teenage Witch Sabrina. Sabrina, yeah, yeah, um, because instead of using the sort of non copywritten generic image of Baphomet, they use the Church of Satan's version of uh, Baphomet. Which is the, I'm sorry, it's the Satanic Temple. I should not say it. It's not the Church of Satan. It's the Satanic Temple. Come and on, Sir, uh, get, get your Satanic churches right. <laughs> they are different. They are very different. Um, so the Satanic Temple built this, this Baphomet statue to put up next to the Ten Commandments in Oklahoma, famously. Um, and this is what they used in Sabrina. They, they copied it, and now they're getting sued for copyright uh, infringement. And, uh, you know, the thing that... that always bugs me about these shows and there's a certain irony here at this point is that they they seem to relegate like witchcraft satanism devil worship all into one thing like as if it's the same thing and that there's no variation and you know these people are always after our children and stuff like that Mm -hmm. but when we look at reality we find that the people who are molesting children are catholic (laughs) priests yeah and we know that that's not suspicion. That's absolute, mm-hmm. definitive proof. Yeah. And the church has been covering it up. But yet people are still, you know, pushing this idea that Satanists and devil worshippers and stuff are the ones. And, and, and to be fair, to be a devil worshiper, to worship the devil, you have to be Christian to begin with. Well, yeah, okay. You, yeah. Because you have to believe in, believe in the devil, you know, to worship, you know, the church is yeah. Satan. The idea was was more socio political than religious, yeah. Um, and the the satanic temple is more political and socio political than it is religious. Uh, you know, defending people's rights and uh, the right to free speech and stuff like that. I mean, they're the ones who said um, when you had a lot of uh, Arabs being attacked. I think it was in Chicago. Mm-hmm. They put yeah. a thing up saying, "Hey, you know, if anyone needs." company walking you know so you feel safe mm-hmm. a member of the church members of the church of satan will escort you aren't they like okay so i know the church of satan are like officially atheists though like it has that yes. on their website yep or is the satanic temple the same way i think so i think so yeah that's just, that's just bs i mean <laughs> you know like if you're well, gonna like I said, it's more socio-political satan, like just but they don't worship hog. satan but the thing is they don't worship satan that's the Why whole not? point because that that's not what it's about. <laughs> well, it does it doesn't make good entertainment though if if it's just like, oh, it's just this rational philosophy and we don't actually do it, you know, it's yeah. and they can't they can't go after say like the Vatican or somebody, so, you know, it's it, it, there's no entertainment in, in actual philosophical Satanism, you know. Yeah, I yeah. just I, I just yeah. don't see the point if you're if you're just going to be a bunch of like Cato Institute like libertarians, <laughs> like why even bother? Like why not just do that? Like why do you have to throw in all this like occult stuff in there? I think it's really just a personality cult of Anton Lavey. Um, you know, I, I I admire him in a lot of ways, well, and yeah. uh, you know he's an iconoclast and and real interesting <laughs> life. And mm-hmm. I think you know since he's been gone, it's just. Yeah, I don't know, you know. Did it LeVay say that the reason why, since it's basically essentially atheism, but he realized that mankind needs some kind of ritual? Oh, yeah. Some kind of yeah. religious ritual, so that's why he incorporated those elements in there, and he said, well, I'll just pick Satan because that's the most shocking and plus the idea of sa- uh, Satan as a rebel, the whole Paradise Lost thing. <laughs> Well, yeah. it's, it was it was more than that. It was a, he was a crime scene photographer in San, San Francisco, I believe. Um, and I think how he put it was that uh, he would he would go out and see people committing these horrific crimes, who would then turn around, and go to church on Sunday, and get forgiven. Yeah. And yeah. he just thought that the hypocrisy and and everything was just unbelievable to him. So Satan to him was the opposite of what that stood for. You know. So that so he put that up as the opposer. 
to the status quo, to, which to him seemed to be this hypocritical uh, stance. And obviously not all Christians are like that. But right. in, in his line of work, his exposure to it was, you know, some pretty horrific stuff. Well, I have an issue with the Satanic Temple's Baphomet because it doesn't have breasts. Yes. Well, they did that so it wouldn't get censored. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, that's the whole point <laughs> is it's a hermaphrodite. Yeah, it's like, a hermaphrodite. It's, you know, like, yeah. that's the point. Like, well, didn't, didn't, they do, didn't they do something else to indicate it was a hermaphrodite, though? I don't know. I don't know. It's I like you get a t-shirt with a cuss word on it, but it's, like, censored. Yeah. It's yeah. like... <laughs> And plus, too, okay, so their whole claim that this show ripped Riz off. We're having their, a hard time with this right I now. Just, I, just, I don't really like this, this Satanist. I'm sorry. Like, and I say this as a person who summons demons for fun. Like, <laughs> you know, like, I just, like, look, just do it. You know, it's the problem with Protestants. Like, just, you know, at least the Catholic Church has rituals, even if they do abuse children. <laughs> it's just like, and then the whole thing about the copyright thing annoys the crap out of me, too, because it's like that image of Baphomet that they use for that statue and stuff is the one that was drawn by Eliphaz Levi. No, it's not. It's like no. almost exactly the same. It, it no is breasts. different. It, no it, there are no breasts. They changed a few things on it, uh, and it was commissioned work by an artist who copyrighted that statue. So did they use like exactly the same statue? Yes. To bring yes. Up? Yes, they did. Well, it's still ridiculous. Copyright's stupid anyway. It depends. <laughs> yeah, um, we know you're a communist. Yeah, but the, the one the one article I shared with you guys, which comes off a, a site called Satanic Mojo, which uh, is a tongue in cheek look at the influence of the dark arts on pop culture, can be kind of a fun site. Um, it says it's they find it suspicious that Warner Brothers are repeatedly using the trademarks of existing satanic organizations to signify devil worship and child abuse. Uh, and are they just laying the groundwork here for a return to the satanic panic? <laughs> no. Oh, they, so. got, they got Muslims I, I, as well. So. I, <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. They just have a lazy art department. I, and, I, I, I do think the satanic panic is starting to come. Well, actually, I'm going to revise that. The satanic panic never really left, guys. Yeah, I, yeah. I, can, I, can, but, I can give you plenty. I can tell you plenty of people that have, that have uh, held the fire or held the flame with for the satanic panic movement for a long time. Well, like, yeah, that, but stuff is never, that stuff has really never gone away. But I I do think that it's starting to kind of come back. Well, just the occult's never Hitler's been more popular, theme. though. Yeah. I well, mean, the, the occult's more popular and socially acceptable now than it's probably ever been in American history. Yeah. Well, that, like, that's You can go that, buy witch kits and like Sephora. You know? Well, that's the backlash against it, though, is a new kind of satanic panic kind of attitude. Yeah. You're going to have that you're going to have that backlash. Hmm. Well, I'll let you guys know when they, when they burn me on the stake. <laughs> I'll be there with you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that actually leads us into another article here, which is the uh, parent. Well, it is from Chapman University, and it is basically a, a survey of paranormal beliefs in a, in, of among Americans. And I find I find this kind of surprising in a way. Um, so they I don't know if it says how many people they surveyed. Uh, it does not, as far as I can tell. Skimming over this, <laughs> that makes um, for a great study. We don't actually know how many people they. Yeah, but it says that fifty eight percent of the people they surveyed believe places can be haunted by spirits. Fifty seven percent believe advanced civilizations such as Atlantis once existed. Um, forty-one percent believe aliens have visited our visited Earth in our ancient past, so ancient aliens. Thirty-five mm -hmm. percent believe aliens are here now. Twenty-six percent believe people can move objects with their minds. Twenty-one percent believe Bigfoot is real, and seventeen percent believe fortune tellers and psychics can foresee the future. And to me, that seems like a weird breakdown. Like. 58% of people believing places can be haunted, that, mm -hmm. that, that seems reasonable. I think, you know, more than half the population believing that is... I think a lot of people believe in ghosts, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and the ancient civilization thing, too, is not that shocking. And I think it's, that's becoming more and more accepted that there was something at some point. See, that one seems weirder to me because 
like I don't know. It's it didn't really you don't hear that much Atlantis. At least I don't like see that much well, like Atlantis kind of stuff anymore. It seems like that's kind of like old timey to me. I think television has done a lot for the ancient civilization stuff. Yeah, yeah you're probably right. Yeah, really popular. My grandpa was, you know, like trying to talk to me about ancient aliens last time I was hanging out with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and whatever criticisms people might have of that show, it has opened people to some different ideas. Yeah, I mean, uh, I absorbed all kinds of pop trash, you know, that got me into cool things eventually mm-hmm. when I was young, you know. Um, and we're going to actually talk about some lost civilizations here in a bit. The one that surprises me is that, that the psychic ability stuff is so low, when that is probably the most proven as f- in scientific circles. Yeah. Well, you, do you see a lot of TV shows about it? That may be the thing. This it's, is the le- yeah. it's, it's the less hyped up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it used this. to be. I remember, like in the early two thousands, there were a lot of shows like John Edwards Show and stuff. I mean, right. you know, yep. he's not right. psychic, but you know what I mean. Like but shows about know, psychic stuff. People like him, though, probably gave it a bad name. Give it yeah. a bad reputation. Mm-hmm. And plus, the ghost shows and the Bigfoot shows; those are much more popular. Yeah. True. True. I was kind of surprised there were only twenty one percent on the Bigfoot thing. Yeah. Yeah. That seems kind of low to me. I think a lot of those are low. Well, that could be two people not, maybe not wanting to admit, and who knows yeah, what the absolutely. where they drew mm-hmm. this from. Um, yeah, doesn't give like demographics or anything. Is it class? Like, are these middle class, upper class people? You're asking. Like, I mean, there's so many variables here. Yeah, it just says American. Yeah, American, um, <laughs> as if we're like a uh, you know a homogenous country. <laughs> <laughs> Need that statistical breakdown. Yeah, it says only. Uh, 24.1% of the people do not hold any of the seven beliefs. Mm. So basically it's saying most people believe in one or two of these things at very least. I want a breakdown of how many people think that Bigfoot is a singular creature. That's so weird to me. I've yeah. Never, yeah. never thought yeah. of it that way. Like one dude. <laughs> I hear that way more he than you tell him. He can seriously <laughs> teleport. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I well, hear yeah, that I way more Bigfoot, than you think. I saw him the other day. He's like yeah. Nightcrawler. Like a lot of people, when they talk uh. about Bigfoot, they talk <laughs> about you know, like Bigfoot in the singular sense. Like it's like one, like it's like uh, like the Loch Ness monster, you know? Yeah, like uh-huh. it's a singular creature. But the Loch Ness monster makes sense like that because it's you one know, place. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what's so odd about it. But I've heard that a lot, a lot recently. Even it's kind of weird. You just running around, dude. Mm-hmm. Like. <laughs> yeah, just really fast <laughs> running through national parks across or he, the can, he, can, he can fly very discreetly <laughs> and and we we were talking earlier about uh youtube comments one of one of the comments i saw get posted was someone saying that psychic powers don't exist and that's that and i'm kind of <laughs> like so you're just gonna ignore the volumes of research saying otherwise okay you know yeah yeah <laughs> i mean out of pretty much anything in the paranormal like Psychic research is like the most well documented and well like studied thing that we have. Yeah, yeah. With, with e- e- even some of the skeptics, the close-minded skeptics have admitted the data is convincing. They just won't accept it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the data is there. I mean, like I don't know if you you don't want to believe in anything if you don't want to. But well, exactly, exactly. That's, that's one of those things where it's like it's pretty clear cut that there's something going on there. You know, there's just too much, uh, too much data to say that says otherwise. I mean, we may not be able to quite explain it yet, but yeah, mm-hmm. there, there, there's definitely evidence that that this stuff, well, that we can't explain this stuff. Yeah. I guess is the thing. And like we we talked about in the episode with Cheryl Lee, that's the trap that I think psychic research has been in for a long time. And what frustrates me about it is this desire to to prove that it exists. And just because like a certain subset of people like won't accept that it's a thing that that can happen, like uh, the people who do the research just keep doing these like experiments to try to prove that it exists. And it's like, guys, just move on. Like, yeah, let, what can we do with it now? Yeah, exactly. Like we we all know it exists. We've known it existed since like the early 1900s. I mean, like let's let's move the research forward and like don't care about what these other people think. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let, let's let's move on to this. Uh talking about ancient civilizations impact crater 19 miles wide found beneath beneath yeah. greenland glacier mm-hmm. um 
And it says, uh, the crater appears to be a result of a mile-wide iron meteorite just 12,000 years ago, which puts it right at the end of the last ice age. Right. Yep, the Younger yep. Dryas event. Yep, Younger Dryas. There you go. Remember which is what, that, what Randall and what uh, Graham Hancock have been saying all along, that we got hit by something around that time period. Yeah, it fits perfectly. And, well, to um, be fair, Graham has been saying that only really because of Randall. Uh, he was saying that something happened then, Yeah, you know, that, that, well, that's so, exactly. so ma ma mainstream archeology span has gone with the idea that everything happens gradually. There's no, that stuff is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Huh? What was that? Adam? Oh, I was saying it was the common impact stuff that, uh, Oh yes. That he was yeah. talking about somebody else was chiming in though. I don't, that wasn't me. Oh, okay. That. That was weird. It sped up on my end, so everything went really quickly. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, Gra doing it too. Graham, you know, Graham was talking about a cataclysmic event versus what mainstream archaeology says, which is that everything happened very slowly. You know, the the meltdown happened, and um, even mainstream archaeologists and geologists admit that the ice age ended too quickly for them to explain by like sudden meltdown. Uh, yeah. That there had to be the, the the energy just isn't there. That there had to be another event, um, and yeah, a comet a comet probably created the uh, the Younger Dryas event, which lasted about two thousand years, and then you have the very sudden meltdown, which was likely something else. Mm -hmm. And that's that's where where I think you know someone like Robert Schock is more online with it um, than Randall Carlson is. Yeah, yeah, shocks thing about like the solar activity. He thinks about, right, yeah. right. I mean, I I personally will lean toward Venus being the culprit. Um, but, the Velikovsky stuff. Yeah, the, the Velikovsky stuff because there is evidence to support that. There's a great book by Laird Scranton where he takes current science and compares it to what Velikovsky predicted back in 1950 and shows that Velikovsky was pretty much on the mark with everything. Hmm. Were you but, uh, are you talking about Venus moving into the solar system and Venus may have been in the Venus may have been in the solar system for a while, um, and made a, a close approach to Earth, which unleashed basically electrical charges that melted everything down very quickly. But is that it's, possibly moving? Is it having an effect and and sending the comets into Earth? Is that yes, what yeah, that is also yeah, exactly. That whatever event created Venus, that Venus was initially a comet. A very, yeah. very large comet. So, I don't know, but this, this is, this is, you know, supporting Randall Carlson and people like that, and uh, Graham it, Hancock and stuff. Yeah, but what did it? What did it say? Um, that it said that it was forty-seven. It had the force of forty-seven million times of of the Hiroshima bomb, the little boy yes. bomb. Yep. That's that's pretty massive, man. I mean, that's just a mile, a mile in radius um, comet. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, they said it was an iron asteroid. Comet. Well, they said it was yeah. like probably an iron asteroid. Yeah, but yeah, you think about a forty-seven million times the energy <laughs> of the little boy nuclear bomb. Yeah, and, and and imagine what that would do to us today. So you know, oh yeah. Yeah, it would well, it would completely destroy our civilization. We'd have a nuclear winter from all the yeah. debris. Uh, the meltdown would flood all our cities. The, you know, I mean, it would be an instant thing. Yeah, it'd that's wipe not out even that, towns. That's not even as bad as what killed the dinosaurs, right? That was a six mile long. Yes. Yeah, asteroid. if if that's actually what killed the dinosaurs, they seem to be unsure about that at this point. You, uh, I, I think that it's a good suspect. Yeah. I think that we'd probably survive an impact like the uh, like the small wide. I mean, we did, right? We were we were alive twelve thousand years ago. Sure, so yeah. We did survive it once. We could probably survive it again. But yeah, you're talking about massive famines because you're you know the global food supply would completely collapse because of the the problems with the weather it would create. So, so yeah. if you had if you had a semi advanced culture or a very advanced culture that that was seafaring and built all their stuff along the coastline mm -hmm. and this happens. Hey, guess what? Your coastlines are gone. Yeah. Well, right. that that plays into the idea that around twelve thousand years ago, like uh, like Gordon White talks about in Starships, you see 
what seems to be this mass migration of people from a some like uh, technologically advanced um, and magically advanced culture into the Middle East and other places from probably somewhere in the south, like Southeast Asia. Mm, yeah, yeah. And like you got these stories in uh, in places like Samaria, these uh, wisdom kings from the east coming and teaching them how to farm and how to build cities and how to do magic. Well, and look at the whole idea of Gebekli Tepe as a way to restart civilization as like a teaching tool. Exactly. We, don't know. we still don't know who built that. Nope. There's some there's some decent ideas out there, but yeah. there's so little solid information, unfortunately. Yep. Could it have been from the refugees of a destroyed civilization in the Far East that, um, you know, after the that sort of peninsula and area of Southeast Asia was flooded and all those cities yeah. destroyed? And that's, well, I've always thought I've always thought that was fascinating of where Gobekli Tepe is, and then you mm-hmm. consider what's in the Bible of where Noah's the the Ark ends up. Mm-hmm. It's not that yes. far, right? Correct. I'm not saying that that's, that that story is literally true. What mm-hmm. I am saying is that there's some kind of memory. Yeah. Grains of that, truth. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in, out in Southeast Asia, uh, let me see if I can talk. Southeast <laughs> Asia, you have Gadung Padung, if I'm saying mm-hmm. that right, which is this structure that they thought was only 2,000 years old. But as they've gone down further, it's getting older and older and older and is predating that 12,000 year mark. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And they've, they've had opposition to digging it up, you know, um, of course, because if it turns out to be accurate, that's that's a huge structure to have been built that long ago. Yeah, it's odd how you have like weird cultural things going on there, because on the other hand, uh, you have a lot of like um, Indian archaeologists who are very like, you know, uh, supportive of this idea of there being sort of this lost um, Indian civilization in this, you know, this Indian Sea and um like trying to get that dug up and stuff. It, it, I don't know. It's weird because when you start getting into this ancient civilization stuff, especially in like the modern era, you'll be these weird conflicts, like national, like nationalistic conflicts as oh, well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because you have these cultures who want to kind of prove that, oh, well, we built the first cities or we, you know, we were the smartest, you know. So, well, that is one of the issues with Egypt because mm-hmm. if the, if some of the structures in Egypt predate dynastic Egypt, mm-hmm. that takes it out of the current culture. And yeah. they don't want that. I mean, it's understandable, but truth is truth. I mean, we should be trying to get to the, the core of it and mm-hmm. stop being so nationalistic with all this stuff. But um, I also found it very amusing that um, in, oh, I think it was Underworld, Graham Hancock talks about how there are certain temples that were supposedly uh, underwater. And they were off the coast. Uh, what's the little landmass uh, off the southeast of India? Sri Lanka, the, yes. the island. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, in between there, there was supposed to be a bunch of temples that had slowly fallen into the sea. And archaeologists said that's nonsense. That's just mythology, blah, blah, blah. Mm. When the tsunami hit back in the beginning of the 2000s, it unearthed one of those temples that was under, previously underwater. Yeah. But no yeah. one was no one was going, you know, in the mainstream was going, hey, Graham Hancock was right. Maybe <laughs> we should look at his other stuff. No, no, no. Look what we found, not. you know. It, 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 make, it, it makes sense, though, guys. I mean, considering that all that was not underwater and uh, when the sea yeah. level was was lower. Yeah, I mean, during the Ice Age, all of the sea levels were, like, way lower, and people would have built on the coast. I mean, there's you, there's probably You could hundreds. walk Britain from Europe, okay? It yeah, was, uh, yeah, Doggerland. Yeah, Doggerland. Uh, like, I mean, that's where, the, the, that's where I think, like, the whole myth of the, the you know, the sunken city of East comes from. Because there were pretty advanced like cities and stuff that were in that landmass between Europe and um, Britain that eventually, you know, is it's underwater now, but uh, you know, back then it wasn't. It was all dry land. Yeah. Yeah. Well with with the Indian stuff, I'm really not well educated on Indian civilization and religion, but the impression that I get is that it's very, very detailed uh, about how old uh the civilization is oh, oh yeah in the religious system is mm-hmm. really about these you know eight successive ages um and you know it, it has that really long-term view so it, it would make sense if they're actually you know if we have evidence for something like that now 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's the um, the Yuga system. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they they ha- they have very detailed history in India, which of course is just chalked up as mythology because anything uh, indigenous people say is just mythology. <laughs> And then when we when we find stuff that backs it up, well, it was just that one thing, right? I I think I think science is like really finds themselves hard to speculate. They just want to prove what they can. They just want to just use the evidence to prove it, you know. But now this that story was amazing, Soraya, because it's exactly in the area where Randall has said it was what well, has said it was going to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Imagine that's good. That's vindication for him. Oh yeah. And he's not the only one that said that, but it is, I mean, it is like, that's his thing, man. Yeah. Yeah. He said he was getting pretty positive feedback from, uh, from yeah. uh, people at universities and he mm-hmm. was starting to do a lot of collaboration and talking to a lot of people. So he needs to get back on Joe Rogan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And and it's this stuff has changed so much from the time that people like Robert Schock and uh, and Graham Hancock started to make it a little more popular. Robert Schock and uh, John Anthony West and and such in the early to mid nineties were the ones first coming out with stuff, and and you know BBC and stuff were just doing hit pieces on them. And uh, Schock, who had evidence that the Sphinx was older, you know, geological evidence was as he yeah. put it, literally spit on. By Egyptologists, I think some right. of this that speculative, uh, you know, hi- ancient history stuff is going to be also a victim of kind of like a a backlash that's happening against a lot of conspiracy culture and stuff. Also, because you know you have these old leftover narratives from Nazi stuff, basically, yeah. and I've I've seen some demonization of you know, this kind of speculative ancient history is being like tied to, you know, necessarily having ties to, uh, that kind of, you know, Nazi esque, um, uh, yeah. racial thinking, trying to, you know, find the, the ancient Aryan race and stuff like that. Oh, so, yeah. Jason yeah. Colavino has been on that kick for a while. I saw some stuff on Twitter about that, about how there are a bunch of people are on this big kick now that ancient alien stuff is racist. Yeah. Yeah. Which I don't quite, I don't quite understand. Like I get kind of what people are saying there. Like this, this idea that indigenous peoples, you know, couldn't have built, you know, pyramids or whatever. Like I kind of get that. Yeah. That that's messed up. And there's, there's a lot of issue with the, you know, the, the, the North American stuff, you know, that goes back to the mm -hmm. British Israelism stuff. That's trying to, you know, prove that it's, yeah, you know, I've I've got a lot of family history and the Mormonism stuff, so I, I know all about it. <laughs> yeah, so like I kind of get where people are coming from, but like Graham Hancock gets pulled into that, and I mean, as far as I know, like I haven't read that much Graham Hancock stuff, but he's not like an ancient aliens guy, right? Not, like not at so, all. Yeah, no, so like I don't understand why he's getting pulled into that. Like I don't think that there's, there's a war there's on no, a lot of speculation right now. I mean, it's uh, it the, feels weird. There's no differentiation. It, uh, just if it's unfortunately if ancient aliens ancient aliens is going to talk about that so the media is just going to say well they all believe this set of beliefs they don't they don't see the differences in in the two camps yeah them, sure. they're all the same i'm sure graham's he's been on ancient aliens right I, that's another oh, yeah. show i don't really watch yeah, yeah so he probably just gets lumped in there because of that so so let that be a, a lesson to people if they want to write about um you know which I, I'm using. I, I like the thing, so I'm not using this word negatively. But speculative archaeology, <laughs> like you know, don't go on ancient aliens. <laughs> ancient racist aliens. Yeah, ancient racist <laughs> aliens. Stay off of that show. Because you're gonna get lumped in with some bad people. Um, yeah, and I don't know. I think there. Would, I think there's a lot of our history that we just don't have. You know, oh yeah, I think, for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. Our, what what we know of really goes back to six thousand BC, and you know we know there was stuff going back to twelve thousand, and that stuff didn't just suddenly appear. So, the idea of a of a of a lost civilization is not that speculative at this point. Recorded history only goes back to three thousand. That's recorded history. Right, right. But but we, we have. That. 
we have like Sumerian stuff from 6000 BC. So we know something yeah, about we, Sumerians. We know they were there, yeah. Um, you know, and that was one of the arguments against Robert Schock is, well, if the Sphinx is so old, where's the civilization that built it? Because there's nothing else from that time period. And then Gobekli Tepe shows up. Yeah. It's As changing. A, it, it, yeah. It's slowly changing. People are beginning to see that there's a lot more to our ancient past than what we know of. And in conjunction with that, there was an article in the BBC News about prehistoric art that hints at a lost Indian civilization. And uh, these are rock drawings that were found in a mountain in, in India that also date back about 12,000 years. And they have no idea who made them. Um, and they say it's most likely a hunter-gatherer culture because most of the animals depicted um, were animals that would be hunted. However... Uh, let's see if I can find where it said it said there were. Ah, okay. Uh, this begs the question of why some of the petroglyphs depict animals like hippos and rhinoceroses, which aren't found in this part of India. Did the people who created them migrate to India from Africa, or were these animals once found in India? Uh, it does say the state government set aside a fund of 240 million rupees, which is 3.2 million dollars, to further study the f study 400 of the identified petroglyphs. Uh, I hope some of the these questions will eventually be answered. Oh, these these okay. So these aren't just paintings. I I looked at them as cave paintings. These are actual petroglyphs on the ground. <laughs> it's for, it's the said, it's, it, it, for the aliens, for the aliens and the spaceships to see. Yeah, right. It said yeah, rock. It, it said rock carving. So I was assuming this was like in a cave somewhere. Yeah, I think it's stuff that's outside. Yeah, it is. It is. And they were created about 10,000 B.C., so about 12,000 years ago. It's like the Nazca lines. Is that what it's called? Yes. In yep. America? Yeah, very similar. Yeah, there's a lot of petroglyphs in North America, too. Like, especially, uh, there's like a bunch up here, too, in Minnesota that I keep meaning to go out and see. But yeah, they were real common. I mean, that's not even that old, though. Like, 10,000 years ago, is, it's not that old, really. I mean, you know, you had civilizations that, were, that had existed around that time period. I think, like, what Katalhayuk was... 11,000 years ago. Yeah, and, and you have Something like... like the, that. Mm -hmm. You also have... Uh, uh, what's the name of the underground city by Gobekli Tepe? Um, it starts with a C, and I'm forgetting the name of it. Um, but it's, it's a huge underground city that could hold 10,000 people. Is it Kento Hayuk? Uh, I think it's connected to that, but there, there is okay. another one. Cappadocia. Uh, Cappadocia. Cappadocia. Cappadocia, exactly. Yeah. It just yeah. came to me as you were saying it. Um yeah, Cappadocia, I think, was the first one found, and it's enormous. And, you know, they, they attribute it to, well, we think some Christians built it around this time, but they have no idea who actually <laughs> built it. They know Christians were occupying it at a certain point. They were using yeah. it, I think, to hide. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't tell us who built it because there's no way to really date it. Yeah, and a city that big, like, didn't just pop up overnight either. Like, it had to have been there for, you know, hundreds of years at least to build yeah. up to that level. Exactly. So. And it's a very well-constructed city. This is not something that was easy to do. You know, It's yeah. not like they, du they dug a hole. <laughs> yeah, and we don't learn to build cities like that. And you know, it takes us a long time to learn how to do that in the first place. I mean, you just see all these discoveries that are just pushing the clock back every time. Yeah. Yep. You know? Yep. Um, <clears throat> well, right, the about where you're from, that's, uh, there's a bunch of petroglyphs out there in the Southwest. You mean just oh, yeah. the small ones on rocks? Yeah. I've seen them. Yeah, I've yeah. seen a lot of those. Yeah, yeah. We take took hikes in the mountains and stuff when I was growing up. I've, I've seen a lot of them. So let's talk about uh, our alien skeleton here. What was it? Atta, I think it was nicknamed. They've actually determined where what it was and where it came from. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know, this, there was a documentary uh, Stephen Greer made about this because he was absolutely convinced that this was proof of an alien gray. Uh, it says, in 2003, someone scavenged an ancient site in the Atacama Desert of Chile, discovered the modified skeleton of something they believed to be alien. The skeleton was a six-inch humanoid wrapped in a linen cloth tied together with purple ribbon. 
Um, the miniature skeleton, which was allegedly buried next to an ancient church, was then sold to a man at a bar for the equivalent of $30. From there, it made its way to a private collector in Spain. After research on the mysterious skeleton was released, the Chilean Association of Archaeologists and the Chilean Society of Biological Anthropology denounced the fi findings for making use of remains looted from holy grounds. Um, so when you look at this thing, it's, it's definitely odd. And it's definitely real. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And Greer particularly pushed it as being uh, alien. They did the documentary on it. And what they, they get to the end of the documentary and they kind of just push the findings to the side. Because they were like, well, yeah, it turns out the mother was human and we don't know who the father was. And that's the end of our documentary. And it's like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> It says uh, they have done a lot of research on this thing now. And it, it says that they believe Otto is suffering from many genetic mutations. And they're, they're, they're going to use their findings to help uh, people living with skeletal problems. But they said they believe Otto's skeleton is only about 40 years old. And that despite the possibility of its fairly recent death, the lack of medical units equipped to handle such debilitating deformities in the area led to her demise shortly after her birth. Um, uh -huh. So, yeah. So, basically, it's entirely human. Now that they, they've been able to determine what was going on, it just, they said the age of it is hard to pinpoint. Uh, despite multiple researchers concluding Otto was an Earth-born girl from Chile, there are a few different theories about when she was born. After performing a post-mortem DNA analysis, scientists were able to discern that she was less than 500 years old because of her rather large DNA fragments. Yeah, didn't they say it's something like probably about 40 years old yeah. or something? Yep, that's, that's yeah. the guess. And from what I was seeing, it was like she was probably a preterm birth with severe skeletal dysplasia and some kind of bone aging disorder that caused these the plates to fuse together. Yeah, yeah. And it was probably due to like nitrate exposure because it's like near a bunch of mining towns yep. there. Just think so, about it, guys. You, you go through your whole life, you know, deformed, and you know you you don't have the as good a quality of life. And then you die, and then some guy comes around and says, "Oh, it must be an alien." <laughs> well, I don't think I don't think it <laughs> lived think very about, long. Just thankfully. think about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, shortly, shortly says, after uh, birth. Yeah, some other guy says, "Yeah, I'll second. take thirty bucks." Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's I don't know. It's it's kind of gross what they did with this this skeleton because ultimately it's just a really sad example of the kind of like working conditions these people in these mining towns these like strip mining towns have to put yeah. up with. yeah yeah and, yeah. and it hasn't and it hasn't changed much in 40 years yeah right and then um, just gets paraded out and this what effectively amounts to like a modern freak show i mean it's like literally the same thing you know these these guys would do back in the you know early 1900s where they'd have these freak shows where they you know take a human fetus and strap it to like a fish and, and tell people it was like a mermaid or whatever. And well, you know, the thing is, it's definitely an interesting thing to find. Uh, yeah. it, it's, yeah. it doesn't look like anything we've ever seen before. It was definitely weird. I don't, I don't, uh, blame Greer for looking into it. The problem mm -hmm. is he went in with the assumption that this was an alien and we need to prove it rather than saying, yeah. let's look, look at what this is. Well, he's but, still doubling down on it, right? Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, he still doesn't accept it. I mean, it's it's one of those things where it's like they just can't accept that, like, bat maybe it's just too scary to think of the idea that, like, humans can be born like this. Yeah. I mean, you know, you look at people who have, like, uh, like Harlequin's, Harlequin syndrome, you know, and, and think, like, are they aliens? It's like, no, they're just people who were born no. with a condition, you know? I don't know. I think it's just because... Greer is a true believer. I think that's yeah. what it is. Yeah, but that's the problem. Is it's like you, I don't know. He like by him doubling down on that, he just shows one of the major problems with with pop ufology. You know, like going oh, yeah. in with these like base these assumptions from the very beginning that something is unearthly, and then being unable to like back down. I think that's why you know, like I know we were talking earlier about scientists not like wanting to speculate and stuff, but that's kind of why in a lot of reasons, right? 
because if you if you go out with some kind of like crazy hypothesis like where do you go from there because either you just double down and like say oh no you're just all you don't don't know what you're talking about or you admit defeat and no one ever takes you seriously again well like, there's, yeah there's, that's what i'm saying that that it that it's positive that scientists mm-hmm. do that because they want real hard proof yeah and that and that's a good thing it's just that there's uh, they there's can be a, too conservative, right? They can yes, be they yeah. can be too conservative and, and too worried about the status quo on, mm-hmm. on everything. But mm-hmm. it's actually that's actually good in many ways because there are a lot of crackpot people out there that sure. just don't you know that that mm-hmm. that do cause damage. But the thing is, when they're presented with evidence, again, like Robert Schock and the Sphinx, oh, yeah. mm-hmm, it doesn't mm-hmm. fit the status quo. It doesn't fit their beliefs. Mm-hmm. So they you know, they ignore it and fight against it. It's a human thing is what it is. Yeah. 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 You know, no one's perfect. And uh, we all have our beliefs and the things that we, we hold, you know, the, those pillars that we don't even necessarily know are there that our, our core beliefs are. Well, uh, yeah, I can see that too. Because, like, what if you spent like forty years of your life working on a particular subject and think you're leaving behind some legacy, and then somebody comes up with something, even if they've got evidence, and they're like, you know, this basically invalidates your entire life's work. Exactly. Exactly. I can see why people get upset and won't like, you know, even even humor it, but. I yeah. mean that's that's just humanity for you. I mean that's yes. just human yeah. human that's exactly concerns. It. Yeah, it's not knowing um, how to separate speculation, you know, and and just mm-hmm. having a place for speculation and having Spec- to get mm-hmm. yeah speculation and belief. Dogmatic. Yeah, absolutely. Because you can speculate without believing what you're saying. You can say, well, maybe it's this or maybe it's this. You know, you could have picked up that odd alien. You know, that odd. Otta- alien i call it an alien when it's clearly not an alien but that's how it's always been referred to uh and you could say well i wonder if this is something not from here but it could also be something from here that we just haven't seen before we should look into this you know instead of being like look i have an alien yeah you know that goes back to the star child skull when i had uh the late uh what, what was his name lloyd pie lloyd pie i had him on once shortly before he passed away and uh as much as I admired what he tried to do with the Star Child skull, the thing that really boggled my mind is when I when I said, you know, he flat out said, "This is the skull of a gray alien," and I said, "Well, you can't say that. We don't. You, we, we would need the skull of a known gray alien to compare it to." And there was a pause, and he's like, "Well, we have one," and I said, "We do," and he's like, "Yeah, the Star Child skull," <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> And that's just a matter. I mean, he wasn't a stupid guy, but he was yeah. just—he believed so strongly that that's what this was. That that was all. You know, that was the end of the conversation. This is this gray alien, and of course, that again turned out not to be the case. Yeah, it's it's that's the danger of getting so in love with your own idea, you know, okay. and being too afraid to. I mean, I don't know. It's 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 a human thing. It really is because it it's is, like definitely. You don't want to have to admit that something you've been working and spending so much energy on for so long is is bunk. You and know, how much or, money you've put into it. Exactly. Like no one wants it. It takes a really strong person to be able to be like, oh yeah, just. I mean, that that's why I respect um, what's his name so much. Um, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name now. The the Rendlesham guy. Oh, Peter Robbins. Yeah, Peter Robbins. Yep. That's that's why I respect Peter so much. You know, being able to basically be like, yeah, this thing I worked on for <laughs> so many years and devoted so much of my life to was crap, and I just yeah. got to kind of move on from here. I mean, like that's that's amazing. And he, that was that was devastating to him too. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, but but it definitely showed his integrity. Yeah, yeah. really. Yeah, I mean, if only other people in the field could be able to do that. Because yep. uh, yeah, what a what a pill to swallow. Um, and 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 the thing is, you know, he he said to me, he's like, I'm sure some of this stuff that I was told from from Larry Warren was true. Mm-hmm. He's like, but now that I you know I, I've I've uncovered some of the stuff that he's lied about, he's like, I have no idea what's true and what's not. So now it's all off the table. It doesn't matter anymore because yeah, right. I have no way to, to sort it from one thing from the other. Yeah, and he's a strong enough person to be able to say that. Unlike someone like Greer, who 
is shown evidence otherwise and is sent, you know, like with the Sata fetus and he still just doubled out, doubles down on yeah. it. Yeah. You know? Well, Greer's more of a showman anyway. <laughs> yeah. The ET people have never had their physical, you know, smoking gun object. Mm-hmm. You know, it's always, there's always been a quest for it. You know, there's always a new thing, whether it's some kind of metal or, or craft debris or, you know, but mm-hmm. they never, it's never come. Yeah. Whereas, you know, there's there's research, there's psychic research, there's actual um, archaeological things that are being debated now on whether they are from ancient civilization. All this other stuff has mm-hmm. actual objects, you know, yeah. but mm-hmm. they've never had one. <laughs> well, uh, what about that guy who kills the gray aliens with a katana? <laughs> <laughs> Why hasn't he got one of the bodies? If he, if he's... That was that was Stardust Ranch, wasn't it? I yes. think so, yeah. Yes. Why why didn't he keep one of the bodies? Yeah. Yeah, yeah why didn't he? <laughs> you can sell for more than 30 bucks in a bar. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um let, let, let let's look at this Irish UFO sighting. And uh I, I particularly like David Metcalf's analysis of it um, because basically this, this Irish UFO sighting came out and it was a pretty solid sighting. And initially it was dismissed as meteors. And uh, then it turned out it might have actually just been a test of uh, some drones and stuff that the British Army was running at the same time, uh, which, you know, makes sense. It's one of the problems with UFO reports nowadays is our technology is so advanced and who knows what else is out there that we don't know about. It's hard to say if anything's truly anomalous anymore. But uh, David David uh, Metcalf went on his blog and just talked about the sloppy journalism that, that accompanies this type of stuff where they just went to like a, uh, what do they call him? A pop science writer. Uh, on the sp- aerospace uh, space industry and just got the thing where he said, oh, well, yeah, it's probably a meteor. You know, that's all it is. And that's what they ran with. I'm looking at this video of it right now. And is it the one where, like, it's just like this like silver object that's just moving through the sky? I believe so, yeah. Like, why? I don't understand why anyone would think this was a UFO anyway, though. I mean, it doesn't look like a meteor, but it doesn't look like, I mean, it's not doing anything that like an aircraft wouldn't do. It doesn't have lights on it or whatever, like an aircraft, but it's just moving in a straight line. So, well, I think, I think it freaked people out because they didn't know what they were looking yeah. at. Hmm. And, but that, again, that's, that's the problem nowadays is that so much of this stuff is, you know, a technology. It's our technology. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that it's really, it's become really hard to separate. What? I mean, it's been hard to separate that, honestly, for the last 30 years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we started drone programs not terribly long after World War II. I mean, we've, True. Been, like, we've been developing drone technology for something like 60 years. Um, and I, I mean, I, I still think a lot of the Black Triangle stuff, a lot of those, those UFO sightings in the 90s were probably drones or drone platforms. I mean, there's a lot of like... Mm-hmm. Like drone platforms now that um, aren't that are still classified. Um, <clears throat> what's that one? It's like a it's like an e- electronic warfare platform. That's like a blimp. It's like a drone blimp combination. And huh. I know um, Sam Sheeran on one. Of, I remember listening to an episode of a show that he was on where he talked about this you know UFO sighting that he had. I, I think in L.A. Uh, when he was younger, and when he r- talked about that sighting, I went and looked up the. Um, sort of rumors about what this drone platform looks like. And it was very similar. Really? Um, yeah. And there's, there's like a little bits of information on it. Cause I, I can't remember which, who was developing. If it was like Bo, if it was like Lockheed Martin or Raytheon or whatever, like who was developing, but there were sort of like some like blueprints production kind of sketches online of what it would maybe look like. And there were some like, you know, various articles and sort of like defense type websites, like blogs that were talking about it. Um, but yeah, it's it's basically like a completely silent, you know, sort of half drone, half blimp combination that's meant to stay in air, you know, for weeks at a time without mm-hmm. having to land. And it primarily functions as like electronic warfare, like it jams radios, yeah. does like it does like interception of like signals, so it can do like signals intelligence. Um, it's like a mobile hacking platform, basically. And I think they've been used in the Middle East. There's like a lot of stuff like that that's. It's in this weird state of being half secret, but half like if you kind of look in the right places, you can find a little bit of information about it. 
Um, but it's not like really widely known that it exists. And I feel like a lot of those things were probably have been in the works for 30, 40 years and, and, and probably account for a large portion of things people were seeing in the past. Because a lot of these like, like drones are super loud. That's the one way you can tell, uh, I guess, separate drones from UFO sightings. Uh, is because like the typical sort of like predator drone, they're super, super, super loud. Yeah. Like I don't know if you ever heard them. They're they're horrifying. Like it sounds like a giant bee in the air. It's just like. Meh. But that doesn't mean we don't have tech to make them quiet, or we don't exactly. have ones that are quiet. That's why I think like some of the things people are seeing are these like hybrid balloon platforms as well. Like they get to a certain altitude and then they like either inflate or use basically uh, the lighter than air type stuff to stay aloft and just have some sort of like really low impulse, low powered propulsion. That's pretty amazing in and of itself. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, yeah. but you know, I think that accounts for a lot of things. <clears throat> and the, yeah. the thing a lot of people don't understand about drones too, I think drones do explain a, a good portion of the sort of uh, behavior of certain types of UFOs where they'll be really still and they'll fly off really fast or do kind of maneuvers that seem impossible because they don't have a human pilot, right? So they're not limited by a human pilot's like ability to withstand G forces. So drones yeah. can make much tighter turns, much faster acceleration. So it, it fits some behavior. Now it obviously doesn't fit all UFO sightings because they're no. like really weird UFO sightings, but uh, and there are plenty that go back way far in time before we had things like drones. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it doesn't explain everything, but I, I think it does explain a good bit. And, and like you said, it's become harder and harder, especially in the last couple of decades, to start to separate yeah. these things out from each other. Um, and we, we should, we should. I don't think this has been touched on the show, uh, but the to the to the stars visit to where was it Italy, Adam? Oh, the vacation. Yeah. <laughs> they went to Italy, and uh, you know, I mean, I think that was a perfect example of the type of of spin you get on everything they do. Because they were saying they were invited over by the government, but they were invited over by basically the the Italian equivalent of MUFON, from what everyone seemed to uncover. Yeah, they were they were speaking to them or something like that. I I don't know. I I really haven't. I I see the posts and stuff. I I don't really pay a lot of attention to it, to be honest. I mean, I I saw it. I glimpsed. I glimpsed at it, and I thought, well, that's interesting. But then when you said it was just like their version of MUFON, that's yeah. one of those. You know, they just they're making it seem like it's more than it actually is. Like the the Italian government is ready to disclose or something. I, exactly. But that's the thing. That's the thing. The game they're playing. Right, and it's it's plainer to see in that example than some of the other ones. Right. Yes. Agreed. And and apparently the slides that uh, Elizondo put up weren't even like the right slides. They were like literal literal known <laughs> fakes that he was putting up in his presentation. And it's like, so how disorganized are you people, or was that intentional? Yeah. So. All right. Uh, anything else we should cover? Because we're running out of time here. I wish I could find that UFO that I saw. I saw a, UFO, a couple of UFO videos on Twitter the other night. And now they're going to be completely impossible to find since I didn't well, save course. them. <laughs> but, like, they were actually pretty cool. I couldn't tell what they were. And they actually were behaving weird. It was like a single light that then split slowly into, like, two other lights. And then, like, a third light came out of it. And there were a bunch of people watching it. But I can't find the video now, so... Dang. Sor Sarai, did you want to ask about talk about this uh, the Matthew Whitaker article without delving too far into which one? Was the <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, that's a good good about amusing big, one to end on. Yeah, big well, I remember travel. I remember Ren said that intellectual property is stupid, but what what do you think about his uh his idea for a uh, what do you call it a, a masculine toilet? Oh, the masculine toilet that rules. <laughs> that you is still think intellectual thing. property is stupid. <laughs> As a person who has, uh, you know, accidentally dipped a nut in the toilet bowl, <laughs> like I have to say that it is a very intriguing idea. Well, let, let me. I'll read this. Though. I'll read. The way Go the, ahead. Go the, ahead. Specific here. Um, actually, let me start. Let, I'll start at the beginning. Okay. Uh, this is about. This is about his company. 
during the current U.S. Attorney General's time on the company's advisory board from 2014 onward, World Patent Marketing <laughs> World <laughs> Star Marketing sound shady. He totally claimed, yeah, <laughs> claimed that DNA evidence collected in 2013 proves that Bigfoot does exist, had a website selling Bigfoot paraphernalia, and planned a celebrity event called You Have Been Squatched. <laughs> asserted that time travel could be possible perhaps within the next decade and tried to raise money using bitcoin for time travel research <laughs> by one of Whitaker's fellow board members the company suggested users might re relive moments from your past or visit your future mm. announced in the same media release heralding Whitaker's appointment to the board a patent application for an extra deep masculine toilet for the well endowed specifying the size of average male genitalia. The release said, this invention is designed for those of us who measure longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> for the, for the big uh -huh. hogs in the audience. I, I did want to ask about the, uh, the DNA evidence on the Bigfoot. Is this the doctor? Yeah, that, that would almost certainly be the David Politis um, uh, Kelba Metchum thing. Okay, Mel because that's the right year, twenty Mel Melba Ketchum. Yeah. Melba Ketchum, Ketchum, yeah. Yeah. Bigfoot evidence. That's interesting. So, um but yeah, and, and I mean that's that's one of those weird things where if you listen to Melba talk about it, it sounds interesting until she gets to the point where she's talking about like being around Bigfoots and Bigfoot habitua habituators and stuff like that. And then people ask her for pictures, and she puts up pictures of things you can't even tell what you're looking at. And it's like, uh, okay. And then now, they say, well, they just don't like their picture taken. They're right. Shy. They're, camera, they're camera shy. I it, just, I'll try to get them to take a picture, but they just don't do it. If it had stopped at we have DNA <laughs> evidence that the main the mainstream DNA people don't want to exist or don't you know want to accept, I could see that. I could, you know, if you're saying, hey, I have Bigfoot. DNA and it doesn't match anything in the you know well, in the record. It's not. I don't think that's quite how it's done. But okay, at least you have something interesting. But the minute you start saying you're hanging out with Bigfoot, it's like, <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, and then well, she start. She said that it that it was in a, uh, in a in a scientific journal, but she made her own scientific journal and the <laughs> scientific so, journal it was in. So the scientific journal that was going to publish it got pressured to not publish it. So she bought the journal and published it anyway. Oh, man. Which is, you know, not something you're supposed to do. It's, <laughs> you know, it kind of takes Conflict off. Of the, interest. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so if, if I'm not mistaken, it wasn't the, like, quote, unquote, Bigfoot <laughs> DNA that was found. Actually, it was human DNA, right? Isn't that, I mean, like, at the conference I went yes. to, that was yes. Pilates' thing was that it was human DNA. Which I oh, want to yeah. remind people, he said he captured by uh, putting tape around a hole in a tree in which he put McDonald's breakfast sandwiches. <laughs> so I'm sorry to admit uh, it, guys, but it was actually me. I was just really hungry, and <laughs> this, I really <laughs> wanted a sausage biscuit. And did he did he say this before or after the guy had the stroke? Oh, this is before the guy had the stroke. In the okay, <laughs> what 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 was this? <laughs> oh, I I went to CryptidCon like uh, a couple months ago with like uh -huh. uh, the Cruise of Mistake guys. And um, I went to the David Pilates uh, presentation there where he went over some of this stuff. And uh, right in the middle of it, uh, this guy had a stro like a stroke. He was oh, like wow. standing up. <laughs> he just like slumped over and fell to the ground. I was like really close to him. And it was and then, like, you know, they waited for him to like get taken out. And then David just started right back up and just didn't even miss a beat. Now, you, you did say that David claimed that the Bigfoot thing was solved, right? Yeah, I mean, in his opinion, yeah. He says that they're uh, they're like a you know tribe of ancient humans or something. Hmm. That yeah, he I bought his book on. I haven't read it yet, but his whole thing is yeah, the book it, the book is worth getting for the incredible like uh, crime like crime sketch reproductions of Bigfoots that are in it. Um, huh. He apparently hired some guy who did like you know like uh, like the little crime sketches they do to, when like you know based on a witness testimony. And so there's a bunch of Bigfoot like sketches in there, but they're all smiling. So it's like super creepy. <laughs> <laughs> They've all got these just enormous grins on their faces. They look very friendly. Huh. 
Uh, oh, and for if if anyone didn't uh, didn't know, the uh, Matthew Whitaker is the acting attorney general of the United States. That's the guy we were talking about with uh, the the yes. Bigfoot DNA and the time travel and the masculine toilet and such. Yes, it was his company that did it, so we don't know yeah. if he believes it himself. But I, I did want to point out that this is one of those cases where. I could almost hear somebody say, well, see, the acting attorney general, he believes it, so it must be true. <laughs> this, is one, this is one of those yeah. cases that I'm talking about where people use that as the evidence for the existence of something, mm -hmm. that this particular person is interested in it. Yeah. yeah. But it just means that particular person is interested in it. <laughs> That's all it means. Oh, uh, that, that, and, you know, smart people can believe stupid things. Stupid people can believe true things. Uh, you know, just because yeah. you have a high office doesn't make you smart, doesn't make you stupid. Does, you know, these these things are not connected. Um, they're they're just not. And Bye. just because someone is really smart doesn't mean they're right about everything. Um, you know, everything is based on our experiences in life and what we're exposed mm -hmm. to. And you could have a super high IQ and be completely off because of things that you know you were never exposed to. You know, you only have half the information and you don't know it. Mm -hmm. I will say it's a little weird that we live in a time in which a guy was trying to build a time machine with Bitcoin is the acting attorney general <laughs> of the United States of America. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we do live in a strange time. Huh. All right. Rand, where can people find you? So uh, I, I keep a blog at liminalroom.com, and you can also find me on Twitter at uh, Mr. Underscore Apol. It's M-I-S-T-E-R underscore A-P-O-L. All right. And uh, Adam on Surfiel? You can find us at www.conspiranormal.com and www.conspiranormal.podomatic.com for the archives. Nice. And where people find you at any other places, Surfiel? You want to point um, them to? Not, not for this purpose. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Secret purposes. Anyway, yes. I thank all of you. This has been a great conversation. Yeah, like, thanks, thanks everyone. Where Did the Road Go would not be what it is without help from our Patreons. And a special shout out to those pledging $10 or more. Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Andy McNamara, Charles Beauregard, Craig Cicernos, Jose A., Scott Morris Everett, Robert Groom, Roland Belsed, Savannah Barlow, Riker and Stark, Sean Cosgrove, Eric Citron, Russell Wilcoxon, Sasha Lord, Christopher Vaughn, Ben Crow, Carla Mahoney, John Eddy, Chris, Mark Brady, William Lovelace, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Kevin Shrek, Alex Bose, and Alfred Tuttle. Thank you all so much. All right, there is a patron extra segment with Adam and Ren that will be up very, very soon. See you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons. And we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.